So I took a deeper look into the book COVID-19, The Great Reset by Klaus Schwab and Thierry Millet. And I'd like to share some parts in there that I think um, are important. But before I do, just a couple things. If you don't like this content, drop me a comment about what content you do like. And I can make those instead. Because I've covered a lot of different th topics. Um, we're still in COVID because it's still something to cover. But, you know, I, on my older videos, I covered a lot of different things. So if this is not the direction you want me to head, I'd sure like you to speak up and tell me. So Klaus Schwab and the Thierry Millet guy, they're nothing special. They're schemers and they're climbers and they're that weasel you know at work who throws other people under the bus for their own glory. I read their backgrounds and their schooling. And yeah, they made some money and they've known a lot of people and they've they have gained some power in that crazy man's world that people think is powerful, which is zero power because everybody dies. But the point being, they're just men. The World Health Organization is nothing. It's like a uh, high-grade think tank slash, um, what's, what am I, non-profit bullshit thing. It's no more important than Salvation Army or any of that crap. So remember that when you hear these guys talk. They're nobody. They're nothing special. We didn't vote for them. We gave them no authority over our lives. And I think we need to be really careful with who we do give authority of our lives to. I hope it's not politicians. It may be your God or your religion or your parents or your spouse. Don't make it politicians because they're a bunch of jackasses, as we've seen in 2020. So, <clears throat> anyway, about this book, the two of the parts I found interesting were one was both in the introduction. They go on to say, but our objective was to write a relatively concise and simple book to help the reader understand what's coming in a multitude of domains. So they clearly say this is what's coming. The truth is, this is what they want to happen. Doesn't mean it's gonna. You can pray, you can um, get with groups, you can find like-minded people and resist. You can do that with anything, really. You guys have probably seen videos where they're kicking sheriffs out of meetings because they don't have warrants. Yeah, you can do that stuff, too. One thing that they really seem hell-bent on is technology. And I know that technocracy seems their easiest way to control the world. No offense to people that have smartphones, but you may have to draw a line where you have to get rid of your smartphone because you don't want to be controlled. That's the choice you get to make. Nobody gets to make that choice for you. So they go on to say the Internet of Things now connects 22 billion devices in real time, ranging from hospital beds, electric grids and water pump stations, to kitchen ovens, agricultural irrigation systems, and they propose by 2030, there will be about 50 billion things connected to the Internet of Things. So they understand technology is the easiest way to corral the humans, the human arrows, the humankind to do what they want them to do. They go on to say, um, this is page 28, many pundits have mischaracterized the COVID-19 pandemic as black swan event simply because it exhibits all the characteristics of a complex adaptive system. But in reality, it is a white swan event, something explicitly presented as such by Nassim Tlaib in the Black Swan published in 2007. Nassim Tlaib sounds like an NFL football player, but it's not. Something that would eventually take place with a great deal of certainty. Indeed, for years, international organizations like the World Health Organization, just an organization, not an authority, Institutions like the World Economic Forum, and this is me again, they call them institutions, like the World Economic Forum, and the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovations, and individuals like Bill Gates have been warning us about the next pandemic risk, even specifying that it, number one, would emerge in a highly populated place where economic development forces people and wildlife together, two, would spread quickly and silently by exploiting networks of human travel and trade, and three, would reach multiple countries by thwarting containment. As we see in the following chapters, properly characterizing the pandemic and understanding its characteristics are vital because they were what underpinned the difference in terms of preparedness. Many Asian countries reacted quickly because they were prepared logistically and organizationally and thus were able to lessen the impact of pan the pandemic. By contrast, Many Western countries were unprepared and they were ravaged by the pandemic. 
It is no coincidence that they are the ones in which the false notion of a black swan event circulated the most. However, we can confidently assert that the pandemic will provoke many black swan events through second, third, or fourth, and more order effects. It is hard, if not impossible, to foresee what might happen at the end of the chain when multiple order effects and their ensuing cascade of consequences have occurred after unemployment spikes, companies go bust, and some countries are teetering on the verge of collapse. None of these are unpredictable per se, but it is their propensity to create perfect storms when they conflate with other risks that will take us by surprise. To sum it up, the pandemic is not a black swan event, but some of its consequences will be. So if you've looked into game theory and black swan events, they're basically manipulating the situation to seem positive to their ends, which is tragic and sad, and that's what evil people do. So I just realized from looking at my notes, this video is going to be longer than the normal one. So if you don't watch it to the end, I understand. We're going to page 30, where they're talking about the historical ver um, scope of what we're experiencing. The global economic catastrophe that we are now confronting is the deepest recorded since 1945. In terms of its sheer speed, it's unparalleled in history. Although it does not rival the calamities and absolute economic desperation that societies endured in the past, there are some telling characteristics that are hauntingly similar. When in 1655, over a space of 18 months, the last bubonic plague had eradicated a quarter of London's population, Daniel Defoe wrote in a journal of the plague year, published in 1722, all trades being stopped, employment ceased, the labor, and by that, the bread of the poor were cut off. And at first, indeed, the cries of the poor were most lamentable to hear. Thousands of them, having stayed in London till nothing but desperation sent them away. Death overtook them on the road, and they served no better than the messengers of death. Defoe's book is full of anecdotes that resonate with today's situation, telling us how the rich were escaping the country, taking death with them, in quotation marks, and observing how the poor were much more exposed to the outbreak, and describing how quacks and Montebox sold false cures. A good majority of this book is equating the COVID virus to some of the most awful things in history, and it's unfounded. It just simply does not apply. And they're either too stupid to see that, or they're doing this on purpose, which if you write a book about a pandemic, I think you're trying to tell a story. And that's what this is. It's just a story. On page 30, in the face of uncertainty, it makes sense to resort to scenarios to get a better sense of what lies ahead. With the pandemic, it is well understood the wide range of potential outcomes is possible, subject to unforeseen events and random occurrences, but three plausible scenarios stand out. Each may help to delineate the contours of what the next two years could be like. These three plausible scenarios are all based on the core assumption that the pandemic could go on affecting us until 2022. So they're trying to establish that. Thus, they can help us reflect upon what lies ahead. In the first scenario, the initial wave that began in March 2020 is followed by a series of smaller waves that occur through mid-2020, then over a one to two year period gradually diminishing in 2021 like peaks and valleys. The occurrence and amplitude of these peaks and valleys vary geographically and depend on specific mitigation measures that are implemented. In the second scenario, the first wave is followed by a larger wave that takes place in the third or fourth quarter of 2020 and one of several smaller subsequent waves in 2021, like during the Spanish flu pandemic. This scenario requires the re-implementation of mitigation measures around the fourth quarter of 2020 to contain the spread of infection and to prevent healthcare systems from being overwhelmed. That one kind of sounds familiar, like exactly what the media are telling us is happening right now. And we'll just finish this up. The third scenario, not seen with past influenza pandemics, but possible for COVID, a slow burn of ongoing transmission and case occurrence followed the first wave, but without a clear wave pattern, just with similar ups and downs. Like the other scenarios, this pattern varies geographically and to a certain extent, determined by the nature of the early mitigation measures put into place in each particular country or region. Cases of infection and deaths continue to occur, but do not require the reinstitution of mitigation measures. So we're clearly not doing that. So it looks like we're in scenario two, according to this book. When we go over to page 44, the title is What Future Growth Could Look Like. 
a little bit into that, it says the deep disruption caused by COVID-19 globally has offered societies an enforced pause to reflect on what is truly of value. With the economic emergency responses to the pandemic now in place, the opportunity can be seized to make the kind of institutional changes and policy changes that will put economies on a path towards a fair, greener future. The history of radical rethinking in the years following World War II, which included establishment of the Bretton Woods Institution, the United Nations, the EU, and the expansion of welfare states, shows the magnitude of the shifts possible. So they very much want to change the world order. They don't like competition. They don't want individuals to succeed on their own. They want it controlled. And this book is telling us that. We're going to skip ahead to page 45. Still talking on the same topic. Additional several institutions and organizations ranging from cities to the European Commission are reflecting on options that would sustain future activity, economic activity at a level that matches the satisfaction of our material needs with respect for our planetary boundaries. The municipality of Amsterdam is the first in the world to have formally committed to this framework as a starting point for public policy discussions in a post-pandemic world. The framework resembles a donut in which the inner rig represents the minimum we need to live a good life as enunciated by the UN Sustainable Development Goals. So there it is. United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, also known as Agenda 21 and Agenda 30. So one of my friends, online friends, um, has a real objection to this New World Order concept. And I understand why. It takes away power from us. It takes away the randomness of life and choice. But it kind of seems like we are walking straight into Agenda 21 and Agenda 2030. And that would constitute a new world order. So I don't know what to tell. I don't know what to say about that. So page 54, they're still talking about the economics. Um, on the other hand... Managing the U.S. dollar sensibly for the rest of the world, doubters of the dollar's dominance point of the incompatibility of its status as a global reserve currency with rising economic nationalism at home. Even though the Fed and the U.S. Treasury manage the dollar and its influential network worldwide with efficacy, skeptics emphasize that the willingness for the U.S. administration to weaponize the U.S. dollar for geopolitical purposes, like punishing countries and companies that trade with Iran and North Korea, will inevitably incentivize dollar holders to look for alternatives. They go on to say, are there are any viable alternatives? And they talk a little bit about using the Chinese dollar and stuff, the euro. They're good, but they're not as, you know, they're not as productive. But they good do go on to say yes. As for global virtual currency, there is none in sight yet but there are attempts to launch national digital currencies that may eventually dethrone the U.S. dollar supremacy. The most significant one took place in China at the end of April 2020 with a test of a national digital currency in four large cities. The country is years ahead of the rest of the world in developing a digital currency combined with powerful electronic payment platforms. This experiment clearly shows that there are monetary systems that are trying to become independent from the U.S. intermediaries while moving towards greater digitization. Ultimately, the possible end of the U.S. dollar's primacy will depend on what happens in the U.S. As Harry Paulson, former Treasury Secretary, U.S. dollar predom- prominence, prominence begins at home. So they're talking about getting rid of the dollar, which <laughs> we have covered Lots of people have call it covered, and it's all just a part of this great reset book. So I'm going to go a couple more sections to keep you from having to read it, but I think it's some information that needs to be out there. On page 57, they're talking about societal reset. Are there any systemic lessons to be learned relating to what has and hasn't worked in terms of dealing with the pandemic? To what extent does the response differ or a response of different nations reveal some inner strengths and weaknesses about particular societies or systems of governance. 
Some, such as Singapore, South Korea, Denmark, among others, seem to fare rather well, and certainly better than most. Others, such as Italy, Spain, the U.S., or U.K., seem to underperform on different counts, whether in terms of preparation, crisis management, public communication, the number of confirmed cases and deaths, and other various metrics. Neighboring countries that share many structure similarities, like France and Germany, had a rough equivalent number of confirmed cases, but a strikingly different number of deaths from COVID-19. Apart from differences in healthcare infrastructure, what accounts for these apparent anomalies? Currently, June 2020, we are still faced with multiple unknowns regarding the reasons why COVID-19 struck and spread with particular virulence in some countries and regions and not in others. However, and here's where they're going to tell you what they think, on the aggregate, the countries that fared better show the following broad and common attributes. They were prepared for what was coming, logistically and organizationally. They made rapid and decisive decisions. They have a cost-effective and inclusive healthcare system. They are high-trust societies in which citizens have confidence in both leadership and the information they provide. They seem under duress to exhibit a real sense of solidarity, favoring the common good over individual aspirations and needs. So if you're not dripping from communism from my words right there, I don't know what else to tell you. This COVID-19 Great Reset book is what they're hoping to accomplish. Um, We're going to do two more sections and then I have a conclusion, so it shouldn't be too much longer. Thanks for hanging with me. I should throw in here that the book's broken into three sections, the macro reset, the micro reset, and the individual reset. And I wanted to read the intro to the individual reset. Here it goes. Like the micro or macro and micro effects, the pandemic pandemic will have profound and diverse consequences for all of us as individuals. For many, it has already been life shattering. To date, COVID-19 has forced the majority of people the world over to self-isolate from family and friends, has thrown into complete disarray personal and professional plans, and has deeply undermined their sense of economic and sometimes psychological and physical security. We have been reminded of our innate human fragility, our frailties, and our flaws. This realization combined with the stress engendered by the lockdowns and the concurrent deep sense of uncertainty about what is coming next could, albeit surreptitiously, change us and the way we relate to other people in our world. For some, what starts as a change may end up as an individual reset. So... Their version of what a human being is, I think, is very small and very weak. And they they probably think of us like cattle. Because we have all been reminded of our innate human fragility, our frailties, and our flaws. You know, we haven't been. Nobody's been reminded of that. We can see it in other people. We all think we're doing the right thing. God created us in however way God created us. Or if it's a simulation, which I kind of think it is. But... Just their their premise of what a human is and how it uh, operates, I think, is deeply flawed. And I think it's not giving enough credit to who people are, what they're capable of. Um, And so it just, I just read this and it just pisses me off because people like this really do have some input. They do have their hands on some of the levers that make society go. And my opinion is they shouldn't because... They're not looking at us as we really are. They're looking at us as they want us to be, maybe. That could be. So here's my conclusion to the whole thing. They seem to want conformity and obedience so they won't lose their their perceived control. Seriously flawed humans are forever fearful of loss. Spiritually and morally bankrupt people should not be listened to. We all kind of have some sort of Stockholm Syndrome. Mask wearers are people walking around afraid of loss. They're afraid of losing their life, their livelihood, their illness. There's nothing to lose in this realm or simulation. All we simply do is rearrange molecules to suit our current intentions. And I think we can see that through manifestation and through synchronicity and serendipity and some of the magic things in life so the reason I wanted to make this video there's I think not a lot of people are going to waste their time to read this book but where media and certain progressive maybe communist I'm not sure what to call them 
governments are acting, they want their new world order, and they're going to try really hard to get it. And all you have to do is say no thank you. That's it. You want a COVID test? No thank you. You want a COVID shot? No thank you. Well, it's going to cost you this. Well, that's okay. We'll figure out another way. We're just going to rearrange some molecules in this realm or simulation, and we'll get what we need. It's all been provided for us. We don't create anything. We just rearrange what's already here. So keep that in mind if you get depressed. And I hope nobody's depressed. If you watch to the end, I'll tell you what. Happy Thanksgiving. Throw that in the chat. Not for me. Throw it in the chat for the person who commented above you. That'll be fun, right? We'll see how many people actually made it to the end. I appreciate you guys watching. I hope you have a wonderful holiday. Um, I hope you get to spend some time with people you love. And we will see you later.